teach what we teach and um, how um, we will, you know, kind of, it'll give us a forward motion into this and then we'll start with lesson one. When I sent this to you, I sent, um, I sent the notes that I made the last class I taught, but we are going to expand greatly on what we are going to read. That's why I had to have my Bible tonight, <laughs> because we're going to read a great chunk of scripture. Um, and I will, um, I will read out loud, but I would love to have readers. Um, so um, if there's somebody, when we get to the reading, we're going to read Re Revelation 1, the chap first chapter 1, um, pretty soon here, but if so, if there's somebody who wants to help, it's only, it's not very long, and um, uh, we will probably read two or three chapters tonight out of the book of Revelation. All right. What version do you use? Um, I'm actually going to be in the New King James, but if you have a different version, and welcome, I haven't, I haven't met you yet. Is it Sharon? Is it Sharon? Shannon. Um, so, um, yeah, whatever version you have, I'm happy with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And I have um, also have the Passion Translation that I read quite a bit out of, and I love that as well. So I usually use New King James because it's kind of a typical Bible that everybody has um, available to them. And, um, but you're welcome to have whatever version you're comfortable with. Okay. All right. So let's just start in the introduction, and I'm just going to start reading, and then I'll chat with you. <laughs> All right. The goal of this class is to get our priorities lined up with God's priorities. Jesus needs his bride here to do his work and to pray. A lot of times um, we've thought maybe in the past that we weren't important we weren't, uh, the church wasn't needed or wasn't important, but we are extremely important to the Lord and the Lord. And so as we're going through this scripture, I'm, I want to add value to who you are, what you're doing, because um, the, the Lord is all about what you are doing, what each of us are doing and how uh, we can be uh, valuable and priceless in this situation in every in in our the people that we affect and everything so I want to um, I pray that's one of my goals in this class is to help you see how valuable and priceless you are to this time frame you were born into the right time frame you were born into this time of history and you will um, you will affect people that um, no one else will um, get to touch like you do so um, we want to be, we want to grow in that, all right? So we want to get our priorities lined up with God's priorities. Um, we want to walk in boldness and confidence of Jesus and his word in the days to come. We have the best answers. The Lord has given us the best answers, and we are a sign and a wonder. Revelation is not primarily about events that will happen, first of all, we know that Revelation is about Jesus, and it's about the Jesus, it's about revealing Jesus, the one we dearly love. Um, we know that he is going to return, and he's going to take leadership of the earth with his bride, with us, so that the nations will be filled with the glory of the Father. And so we know that Revelation is not a doomsday prophecy, but it's rather it is a, um, a good word. It's about the evil that we recognize in this world coming to an end. And um, we are, Jesus is going to usher in a whole new beginning for all of us. Um, we're coming to the end of, of uh, the dark night of Satan's oppression of human history to a, a new chapter of God's glory. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see that get started. And so... Um, that's why we're doing this class. Uh, as the book of Acts describes the power of the Holy Spirit that was released through the early church, so the book of Revelation describes the power of the Holy Spirit that will be released through the end time church. Revelation is talking to us, the end time church. We are that people. We are that group of people that the Lord is speaking to. And um, we, are, we are valuable and needed in this day and age. Um, there's 150 chapters in the book of Revelation, or in the whole Bible, that um, refer to the last days 
or the day of the Lord. And we'll see those uh, particular scriptures that we'll go through um, over and over. We'll, we'll hear the words, the day of the Lord, um, the great day of the Lord. You'll hear these certain catchphrases over and over that the Lord uses. And when we see those, we'll know that this is the day that the Lord is talking about. The days that are to come and, and the days that we're starting to enter into right now. Now, um, I'll probably say this again, but Israel, we know is we believe Israel was our the beginning of the time clock of when the last days began. Um, uh, I did give you a chart in the uh, uh, in your uh, downloads, and I have a large chart. I'll have this hung up next week, but I I just want to kind of show it to you. This is the chart in very large size, and uh, I'll probably hang it behind me next week. But we are right here. We're at the very beginning of this birth pang time where um, we know that when Israel became a nation, all of a sudden, the last day's storyline, the timeline of the last days began. Now, that was in 1947, or could be, you could even consider 1960. Uh, 60, was it 67? Um, Catherine, you would know that. <laughs> I think it was 1967 too was the other war. And so one of those, yeah, one of those two timeline or time, two time periods, either the forties or the sixties was when that it was like the great hourglass of time. God said, okay, Israel's now a nation again. He flipped over that thing where things had been like silent for a bunch of years for two almost 2,000 years and um, uh, although a lot had happened and a lot of different um, uh, you know a lot of different world events have happened but Israel was quiet because Israel was not a nation it was all spread out in the entire earth so in 1947 when Israel became a nation again it was like boom things are started back up again so um so this there are a lot of the things that we talk about we're going to talk about in this class that never could have happened before 1947 there wasn't that opportunity and um nine and or 1965 the the um some of the things that we um talk about the in gathering of israel the um uh, Israel coming back, you know, as a nation was so key to what we're talking about today that there's no way that this could have ta happened. Uh, there's a teaching out there that says um, all of these things that in the book of Revelation happened in 19 or excuse me in 70 AD. Well, that's impossible because um, Israel was being destroyed. And there's so many things that we'll talk about that are going to happen in Israel, in Jerusalem, that we know that that is not true. There was had to be a time uh, leap, a leap in time, and a, a time again where Israel was regathered to the nation, to the land of Israel. And what an important day that was, and we live in now. All right, so let's go on in our notes. There's 150 chapters in the Bible regarding the end times. The Lord entrusted the prophet Isaiah with more passages, more revelation, more information about the end times than any man in the Bible, even John, the revelator. Um, so during this study, we'll take scripture from the entire Bible that will help us understand Jesus's plan, both now and what is to come. We want to understand so that we're confident in God's plan and we're able to explain what's happening to those people around us. Um, I think uh, we're watching something happen in this day and age that is absolutely stunning. And um, I don't know about you, but I was not surprised the first time I went into the grocery store and saw the shelves empty. I actually thought, oh, we've known this is going to happen. <laughs> and, I, and I just thought, isn't that interesting? We knew it was going to happen, and here it is. And I hope you had that same feeling of there was no, I didn't have any fear. I just had, well, isn't that interesting? And I, and several times I thought when there was something that there was very few of, I thought, you know what? I want somebody else to have that, and I want, um, I'm going to leave that for somebody else who does need it. I, I don't need it right now. And so I felt just such a peace and a, 
a contentment in my own heart, not needing to get everything I thought I, you know, we, we might yeah, want. Exactly. We just didn't need to do it. So, uh, and that's the kind of peace that I want this class to bring to your heart. I want you to, to leave this class thinking, you know what? Jesus is with me. He's going to provide for me everything. I'm okay. I'm okay. And um, I don't have to have everything. And what I do need, the Lord can multiply. Um, I've watched, and I'll tell stories of multiplication with you um, because I have seen with my own eyes, <laughs> my own stomach, I've watched multiplication happen. And it is phenomenal what the Lord does when he multiplies food or provision or healing or whatever it is that we need. So, all right, we're going to move on. But I want you to keep that in mind. There's not just the book of Revelation. We're not, and that's why we titled this Last Day's Study, because it's not just the book of Revelation. There's 150 chapters throughout from Genesis to Revelation 20 to the very end of Revelation. There's all of these chapters and they all pertain to the last days and they're important and we don't want to leave out any of them. We may not have, we will not have time, I can tell you that. We will not have time to study all of them, but this will give us a good overview and a good picture of how to, um, what the whole picture looks like, what the big picture looks like. All right, so that's our goal. All right, um... Let's go down to this goal is not, okay, the goal is not to be dogmatic. Okay, so I I started out teaching this class from a, a pre-trib perspective. I taught it, um, and I was ordained in the Assemblies of God. Um, I grew up in the Assemblies, and the Assemblies of God was pre-trib. The, their schools, their seminaries, they all taught pre-trib. And if um, you're going to, I'm going to just give you a basic on, um, the time frames. What happened was um, the churches got caught up in a system of time frames of when the Lord was going to return. They would believe they believed either he would be he would come back at the beginning of the seven years of tribulation, or he would come back at the middle of the seven years of tribulation, or he would come back at the end. And we lost sight of who is coming back. That's what's important. <laughs> Whenever he's coming back, mid, uh, beginning, mid, or end, that's not the key, and that's not what is most important. What is most important is that we recognize who this Jesus is. We recognize his plan, and his who when he shows up in the heavenlies, we recognize that is him. Um, so our, that will be our, our main goal as well. And we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. So I'm not going to say um, you need to be pre-trib, pre you need to be mid-trib, you need to be post, or you need to be... I, uh, I actually believe, and I'll just tell you this right up front, I believe that, that Jesus will return at the last trumpet. Because I, I lean on that scripture that says at the last trumpet... Uh, when the last trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise, and, and that's what I believe. Now, that's not at the full end, and we'll explain all that, but um, I, um, if Jesus comes pre-trib, glory to God. If Jesus comes in the middle, <laughs> glory to God. If Jesus comes at the end, Glory to God. I want to be ready whenever he comes. And whenever he comes is not what's important to me. It's What's important to me is that I recognize who he is. And that I recognize the signs of the time. Because the Lord wants us to um, be aware of the times and the seasons. He says, be aware of the times and the seasons. So that you'll know where you are in the timeline of everything. All right. Um, so I'm not going to be dogmatic about a time frame. Instead, I'm going to present scripture and present the possibilities and let you decide for when you, when you believe that the Lord is going to return. Um, and, and I hope that even as you read through uh, what we study here, that you'll not be, you know, demand he come a certain time. And this is, 
this is one of the reasons we do this is because we want to have um, a different perspective than is commonly taught. I was taught uh, pre-trib like I told you for uh, decades and then studied it and taught it. And it left me with so many questions that I came out and I thought, you know what? This is so important. I don't ever want to teach this and sidetrack somebody from um, actually getting their arms around the book of Revelation in a different way of them, my understanding. My understanding is not what's important. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's book. It's the Lord's revelation. In fact, the book of Revelation is the the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's, <laughs> that's what we want, is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of Stephanie. You sure don't want that, because that's going to be a disaster. <laughs> So we want to hear from the Lord, and this is where our, our um, hope lies, right? All right. Um, I urge you to search out your scriptures. Don't believe it because I said it. Don't believe it because uh, the teachers that I uh, study said it. Study this like a Berean. We all want to be that Berean that goes to the Word of God, and let's see what the Word of God says, and we're going to hammer this out and, and make the Word of God tangible to us. Look at it seriously. And if you come to different conclusions, I'm not going to be offended at all. I want you to, um, to search out the scriptures, all right? Um, we want to be thinking believers that are not divisive, but rather critical thinkers. Um, and let's stir up conversation, not division, in the study of God's Word. Um, the church in America is not the only church that holds the key to revelation, uh, to understanding the end times. Many around the world have been seeking out the word of God. And I, um, I have studied, uh, several, uh, is, uh, Hebrew or Israeli scholars too. I love what they have to say. In fact, I think it's very important that we hear what men like Jonathan Kahn say, like, um, that men like um, Robert Stearns, or um, I might have the first name wrong, but those those men out there that have been in Israel, been in the land, um, they their point of view is extremely important. Um, and so let's go on to the next page. We need each other, right? And we need the church in general in the in the whole world. Uh, during the last days, we will not be helpless victims of Satan, but rather, the judgment events of Revelation will be released through us. We're going to talk about this a lot. It's important that we understand and that we work with the Lord as these last days things are being released and that we're not standing there saying, Oh, Lord, stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> we need to be the ones saying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see what you are going to do, Lord, and how you are going to defeat the enemy and how you are going to um, bring your kingdom come on this earth. Now, we'll spend a whole night on the kingdom of heaven, on the millennial reign, and that is my favorite class to teach. It's a lot of fun, and it's one of the most enjoyable classes, so we will, we will be looking at that before long, so that will be fun. All right, for those concerned about persecution, go to that heading. There's only 403 verses in the entire book of Revelation, and only 12 verses in the entire book of Revelation are about persecution of the believer. So I want to put your soul and your heart to rest right now. We are not going to be looking and giving you a doomsday look at the torture that's ahead. <laughs> Never my, my, my perspective. My perspective is that the Lord is good to us and we are going to see the hand and the deliverance of the Lord. And there, if there's only 12 verses in the whole book of Revelation on the persecution of the believer, I think we can handle that. Um, many in the church today, or worldwide, have had huge um, persecution, things that we could never imagine, and um, are suffering today like never before. There's been more martyrdom deaths in the last 10 years than in all of time since Jesus died combined. 
It's stunning the amount of persecution that is going on right now. And can I say I believe the persecution of the saints has been since Jesus died. The persecution of the believer has been in this 2,000 years. And I believe the persecution of the enemy is on the way. <laughs> and that's what I want to see happen. I am ready to see the enemy taken out of his... Um, of his place um, in this system that we have now, this Babylonian system that we have now. It says, and we believe Babylon will fall. We be I believe the enemy, the Lord is going to take out the enemy like none, like never, we've never seen the vindication of, of his people. And so I look forward to that day. All right. Um, let's see. So we want to fall in love with Jesus. When persecution happens, we're not going to be offended. We're not going to fall away. Um, we're not going to be confused because the Lord said we will have tribulation. We will have difficulties, but we are not going to fall away. We are going to be the ones who are going to stand strong. All right, so turn in your Bibles to Revelation 1. And do I have anybody that would like to read? I would love to give you a chance to read. And is there... Say that again. I said, Marie, I'd like to read. You would like to read, Sarah? S Susan? Oh, Maria would like to read? <laughs> yes. I'm glad you guys know each other. That's so cool. That's so cool. We love each other, too. We love each other, That's too. just... I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, I'm happy. That's very good. Okay, so... So, uh, Susan, would you like to read, too? Can we split it? Can we break the book up in, into two pieces? Sure. Okay. Okay, Maria, why don't you read the first? Um, why don't you read to verse uh, 13? Let's see. 13? Now, 12. Okay, why don't you stop it at 11? So the last chat, last verse you'll read is verse 11, and then I'll have uh, Susan start at verse 12. Is that okay, Susan? I kind of wrote you in. Okay, sure. go right ahead. <laughs> okay, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to everything he saw is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud hmm, the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is Amen. Greetings and apology, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to from who, who, is, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, and those who pierced him, and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Amen. I'm Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, was, and who is to be Almighty. John's vision of Christ. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of the Lord and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All right, Susan. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right
right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. I am he who and the and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which I will take that will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. So in that first chapter, we actually get the best look at Jesus and what he looks like um, of anywhere in the Bible, in the whole scripture. We have this one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His hair is, is um, white like wool white as snow his eyes are like flames of fire his feet are like fine brass he is ref if as if refined in a furnace and his voice is the sound of many waters what a picture of Jesus um, that we have from this scripture and he says I am the first and the last and one of the things he says um, in verse uh, 17 or um, yeah 17 one of the very big things that he says and I hope you underline every single time he says do not be afraid because he's uh, the Lord is so serious about us not participating with the spirit of fear and not being fearful people um, he says it in the scripture he says do not be afraid do not fear he's commanding us not to fear it's so important 366 times through the scripture and I want you to think we have 365 days in a year typically, but this year we are, it happens to be a leap year. There's 366 days he didn't forget leap year. We have a do not fear for today as well, for February 29th as well. So I want you to remember that we are absolutely not to fear. Whenever you have any, you have something in your heart that is causing you fear, here's what I do. Lord, what is it in me that is not trusting you and the Lord will reveal it to you he will show you because he wants uh, wants to take us out of that place of fear um, because it will stop us it will uh, paralyze us many times it will keep us from doing what we know we should do so he is the one who loves it he loves to take us out of that place of fear so we want to participate with the spirit of power and of love and a sound mind, right? right. <laughs> I was thinking this week because I was talking to somebody who was being who was who had some fear issues, and I was thinking about um, how all the time I'm always saying, "Do not participate with the spirit of fear." And when we participate with the spirit of power, it's the opposite of fear. Power gives me strength. Power says, I know who I serve, and I'm going to focus on that, and I know he has power. He has all power. And I. so it's like I'm going to participate with the opposite spirit, and when I turn to fear, it shuts off my power. So spirit, love, perfect love casts out all fear. And when I operate with fear, I absolutely can't operate in love because I'm operating out of fear. Do you see how that works? And then sound mind, fear takes away every bit of strength we have in our mind. <laughs> we can do some of the, um, we can get off on something and believe a lie. We can get stuck in some sort of thing when we, um, when we are participating with the spirit of fear and it will totally drive us into a place of anxiety and fear. So I want to encourage you right now, you and I, all of us, we need to be the ones who have the answer on this question because there's so many people suffering with anxiety, with struggling, with thinking about everything that they're doing. And the media, um, I told people right off the bat when we, when this whole media thing started with the the crisis, the COVID crisis, I said, turn that 
off because they're not preaching strength and they're not even giving us wisdom. They're giving us a spirit of fear. And I actually had somebody, um, uh, let me tell you a dream. Um, somebody today wrote me a dream and it was really good. It was a, she had two tornadoes. There were two tornadoes in the dream. This is tornado season. I'm from Kansas. I know what tornadoes are. <laughs> I've lived through them. Um, but the um, dream that they had was a whirlwind was coming at them. And I actually believe that first whirlwind was a was uh, the Spirit of the Lord. We know that we can have the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, you know, there was wind and fire on the day of Pentecost. And um, we can have a movement of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes revival looks pretty messy, but it can stir us up and stir up this fire within us. But the second tornado... A hyena came out of the second tornado and she said, I felt such a spirit of fear come over me. And I said, boy, what a dream because the Lord was giving you the heads up that there's going to be a spirit of fear come in the next whirlwind that you're not going to participate with and that you are going to be prepared for when it tries to come. A hyena is like a dog. But you know how they're 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 not good dogs. They're not friendly dogs. <laughs> they're uh, wild, and they would come after you. So, and they scream. They have like a scream that puts the fear into whatever prey is around it. So, we will not participate with the hyena, <laughs> with that spirit of fear that wants to come at us. But we will participate with the spirit of the presence of the Lord, and that's what where we want to be. And if you get into a place, and I don't, I'm sure not making light of this. If you get into a place of anxiety, um, get to a place where you can stop and just breathe. Um, some people, some people I know, are dealing with some heavy duty situations right now, and just begin to breathe and just say, Lord, I agree with you. I agree with heaven right now. I agree with what you are doing. I agree with how you're going to do it. And I fully trust in you, Jesus. So I just want to give you that little heads up. When we begin to agree with the presence of the Lord, our heart changes, our heart settles down because he is the one we love. He loves us so dearly and he's taking care of us. We must, uh, we are stepping it up a level on our trust. And there's going to be more during this class in particular that we'll talk about on that. All right, my friends. Okay, let's keep going because what we just read was John 1. And in your notes, I'm on page 2 on this um, kind of in this beginning part. Now I want us to look at Revelation chapter 2. And I love chapter 1, I love chapter 2, and I love chapter 3. But I will tell you, these are the three chapters we will not spend a lot of time on. Um, because we will spend more time on the timeline uh, from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 22. Um, these first three chapters actually deserve their own study on their own. <laughs> They're so powerful. Um, and I actually want to memorize that for chapter 1 of Revelation. It's so powerful. And um, so this is the church's... Um, that the that um, the Lord is talking to in Revelation um, chapter two, and let's let's read them uh, out loud. So, who would like to start with uh, the loveless church at the Church of Ephesus? Uh, Catherine, I have you up on my screen. Would you want to read chapter two? Sure. Would that be good. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, so, chapter that one goes clear to verse seven. Chapter okay. two, one through seven. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deed you did at first. Or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Very good. Thank you. So the Nicolaitans were um, the ones who were like compromisers. They brought in idolatry into the church. Kind of reminds me of Constantine. If you've ever done the study of Constantine and uh, that beginning, um, what he did to the church where he demanded that we not celebrate like the Jews do. He was very much anti-Semitic and he said we will um, instead of celebrating uh, Passover, we will celebrate Ashtoreth, and that's where we get the Easter uh, story, and that's where, and so he made all of the pagan holidays into um, something that we would celebrate, and he, Constantine was the reason that we have Sun Day, because he worshipped the sun. Moon Day, because he worshipped the moon. He was he was a burger. <laughs> he Twice Day, Wines Day, Thor's Day, Freud's um, let's see Freud's Day, and Saturn's Day. So that's why we have the days of the week that we have. There are some countries still that say first day, second day, third day. And uh, that's, I, I think that's a precious way of doing it, but it's not common in our, our culture here. But the, so when you think of the Nicolaitans, they were the ones who compromised and said, sure, we can do some idolatry as long as we make it look like Jesus, okay? <laughs> or may we make it look religious or like God. So, okay, does that, does that bring a little bit of clarity to that? Um, now, all of the churches, the seven churches of Revelation, uh, many people believe they are time periods um, that have um, gone, and I used to have them all written down. I don't think I have them written down right now in my Bible. Oh, I may, actually. Anyway, um, um, there's different time periods that they go through, but we're not gonna we're not gonna take time on it. It's a historical study, and it really is fascinating. So. Um, maybe that'll be the next class, but we'll see because <laughs> I should go back through it. It's a great study. All right, let's do the persecuted Heather, church. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, Susan. Um, so as I read the second chapter, yes, and I read about all the different churches and how they're going to lose their lampstand if they don't knock it off. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> I sort of read that into my own life as though, uh-oh. Is that me? Do I fit into that church? And are we supposed to read it like that? Well, we that's a very good point. And, I, you know, I always want the Lord to judge my heart. So, um, but I don't, he will not give us, he will not condemn you, Susan. He, he does not bring condemnation. Remember uh, Romans 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So keep that in mind. But, but do, be like David did. David said, Lord, it, is there any wicked way in me? Search my heart. Check me out. And so that's what we want to do. And, but in a positively knowing that the Lord is loving us and has tremendous mercy and grace upon us. And uh, he, we just want to get close to him, right? We just want to love him and... Um, yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to participate with any of that idolatry. I just did Passover, and many of you just did Passover, and uh, the res we celebrated the Resurrection Sunday. And the big thing of, of Passover is I'm not going to participate with any idolatry. I repent of any idolatry that I've had in my life. And so that first one right there, we can all do that. We can say, Lord, if there's anything I'm worshiping, and we, I, I made the joke that um, we've, we all had the runs on, you know, everybody went on and ran on and got toilet paper like crazy, and that, like, it's going to save us. I, I, that was baffling. <laughs> it's not going to save us, <laughs> and I kept thinking, isn't this interesting, because I've been to countries where they don't have toilet paper, and I thought, you know, everybody else in the world makes it without it, so we'll be fine if we don't have enough, but I'm actually believing our toilet paper is going to multiply. So if y'all are not having enough toilet paper in your house, just pray. And the Lord, in fact, I even found toilet paper I didn't even know I had when we were starting to run out because we've got more people in our house right now all the time. And as most of you do. 
but I was shocked to find toilet paper I didn't know I had. So the Lord will multiply. We're going to have everything we need, right? <laughs> okay, let's look at um, the next part, the persecuted church. This is verse 8, and who else would like to uh, read? We're going to read verse 8 through 11. I will. Okay, go right ahead, my dear. <laughs> and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are not Jews and are not. They are Jews, are yeah, <laughs> which is silly. They're saying they are Jews, but they're not. Yeah, go ahead. But are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He overcome her second death. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, who would like to read the next one? Verse 12 through the end, through uh, verse uh, 17. Do I have a, a uh, volunteer? I'll read it. Okay. I'll read it. Okay, Sandra. And to the angel of the church in per Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know the works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my father was killed was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, give him a hidden man, and a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. What an amazing passage. All right, I'm going to keep going. But notice there, they're so, they are warned against, again, idolatry, against sexual immorality, and uh, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which is definitely that compromising spirit again that says, hey, I can, I can do what I want. I can worship whatever I want. I can bring whatever in. I'll be okay. And it's not okay. All right, the corrupt church. Who, um, who would like to read that? Do I have a volunteer? I will. Okay. I will. I will. All right, go right ahead. And this is clear to the end of the chapter, eighteen to the end. Go right ahead. Is it me? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? I heard. I heard somebody else say it too. Is oh it no, okay? go right ahead, my dear. And uh, to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like varnished bronze, says, I know your, your love and, and perseverance, and that your deeds are late, of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerated the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and teaches that and teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so that you commit acts of immorality, immortality, immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I give her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon the bed of sickness, 
and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the, de the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have will fast is like you become. He who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nation. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of, of the porter are broken into pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Vicki. That was good. Uh, All right. Do I have one more reader? I would like well, to read. Okay. Go ahead, Megan. Thank you. Let's see. Um, how far you right? are reading to verse 6. Okay. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis, the one who has the Spirit the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are right. dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. But if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come against you you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy in the same way the victor will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels anyone who has an ear should listen to what the spirit says to the churches Thank you, my dear. Uh, Melissa, I saw you up there. Would you like to read yeah. next? Okay, yeah. wonderful. So the seventh church, uh, or number, verse 7, clear to 13, please. All right. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Philadelphia. For these are the solemn words of the Holy One, the true one, who has David's key, who opens the door that none can shut, and who closes doors that none can open. I know all that you've done. Now I have set before you a wide open door and none can shut for i know that you possess only a little power yet you've kept my word and haven't denied my name watch how i deal with those that sin of Satan. say the jews are not for they are lying i will make them come and bow down at your feet and acknowledge how much i've loved you <laughs> because you've passionately kept my message of perseverance i will also keep you from the hour of approving that is coming to test every person on earth but i will come swiftly so cling tightly to what to what you have so that no one may seize your crown of victory for the one who is victorious i will make you to be a pillar in the sanctuary of my god permanently secure i will write on you the name of my god and the name of the city of my god the new jerusalem descending from my god out of heaven and i will write my own name on you so the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is now saying to all the churches. Very good. All right. And then uh, who would like to read? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. And then the next, who would like to read the last one? Jeff. All right, Jeff, go right ahead. Clear to the end of chapter 3. Okay. Lukewarm church, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So, so then, because you're lukewarm and cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy have need of nothing. You do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold or find in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness 
may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. Very good. Thank you. All right. So these three chapters, chapter one through three, are extremely important. And just because I'm not going to spend time on them, I don't want to leave you with the thought process that it's not important. It's extremely important. And what I kept noticing over and over, and maybe some of you will have an, uh, a thought on this, but what did you hear um, that they wouldn't repent of over and over? Sexual immorality, yeah, right? Immorality and idolatry. Idolatry. What else? I don't know that they said stealing, but we're gonna we're gonna see that as being one of the four things that they will not repent of, and then the fourth thing is murders. So we went to. I just wanted. I was actually surprised when we were reading through it this time. I was thinking, wow. Even then, the Lord was showing what the major issues are with the church, with the churches back then. That they were uh, oh, satanic worship. That's the other thing, the 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 willingness to allow idolatry. Um, gross idolatry is not just having a Buddha sitting in your house. It is some of the most wicked stuff. And we are seeing Buddha never wanted to be worshipped anyway. I don't believe he's a god, but they they set him up as a god. And um, but the gross idolatry that is going on and the satanic worship that is going on that we know about in our day and age is has be has come to a high level and i believe the lord is um to the end of his patience on this because you cannot continue this we know that we have the outcome of that is abortion the outcome of that is murder the outcome of that is drugs sorcery and drugs run together um and we are seeing those things um at a high level in our nation, in our world this day. And so um, I just want you to keep those things in your mind as we go through the book of Revelation because it's going to pop up over and over and over again. Yes, you have That's a question. A good question. I'm yes, sorry. Maria, go right ahead. Very, very naive question. When there's the churches, these that are churches. Okay, I'm sorry. It broke up just a little bit, but I'm thinking you asked me. Uh, is this the churches that this was happening in, right? No, 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 no. Are these seven churches considered Christian churches? Yes, they were That's considered like the church. church. Yeah, That's and That's crazy. Yes, and they're considered the time, and the and they're also considered timelines through history. So this really is a good study. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen. Um, the things that are going on in America right now, abortion, if the church would have stood up and said no back in the 70s, we wouldn't have abortion. Do you know what I'm saying? We, the church, need to stand up and take our rightful place in our societies. And there's been a lot of things people say, well, we're not supposed to be involved. Yes, we are. God told us from the very beginning uh, you have authority over the land and over the world. And listen, our, our world would be much better if we did not have things like abortion and satanic ritual worship and all of that kind of stuff going on. Our, our world would be better. But the church has not stood against it. And um, we have um, the sex trafficking and things like that. And it's all related. And it's all, we need to be the church that stands out. I'm not blaming, listen, I'm not blaming those of us who believe we would never allow this to happen. And there, and that's been true of the saints before us. But um, it's when good people refuse to stand up and do good things and say no to what um, wicked people want to do, that's when there's problems. 
So, and I'm not, no blame on anybody here. I didn't, I don't have any power. You and I, none of us really have any power to stop abortion right now. Other than we can pray, we can believe, and we can talk. <laughs> we have a mouth, we have a voice, and we need to use our voice. And so that's what we need to be doing. And there's other things that we can do. So, and I know a lot of people still are protesting and doing everything they can and saving lives other ways, um, saving babies. And so that's what we want to, we'll do everything we can do. That's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's much, but it is a lot. Do what we can, do what we can do. All right, turn in your um, notes to the next section, session one, and we're going to go ahead and start with this. And we'll end right at eight o'clock because we're going to break you up into groups. So if we, we don't, we probably won't get all the way through this tonight. But we will stop at 8 o'clock, and then I want we're going to break up into groups so you guys can meet each other and uh, just have a little bit of time together. All right. So we just talked about uh, Revelation 1 to 3. Now we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 4. And let's look at, at the throne room of heaven. What, a, what a, an incredible scripture it is here. Um, and let's, let's go right ahead. And let's read the throne room of heaven, chapter 4. We're going to break this up. I want you to see how short most of the chapters of Revelation are. This one is only, uh, let's see, 11 verses or 12 verses, 11 verses. So it's so short. So here we go. Who would like to read the first uh, six? Is six a good place to stop? Four, five. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's read the first six verses. Who would like to do that? Do I have a volunteer? Megan. Okay, Megan, go right ahead. Jump in there, one to six. Okay. After this, I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and a throne was set there in heaven. One was seated on, a throne, on the throne, and the one seated looked like jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Around that throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne... Living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were in the middle and around the throne. Wow. I want you to see how much we have, uh, how much description we have seen of Jesus and of the throne room of heaven. It's stunning, just in four chapters. All right, who else would like to read? We'll read seven to the end of the chapter. I'll read. Oh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elves fall before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Wow. That's so powerful. Did you hear that? <laughs> Worthy are you, O Lord, who was and is and is to come. We agree. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So from there, I want you to turn to chapter 5. And this is where the whole thing begins. We are in the book of Revelation, but chapter 4, we are in the throne room of heaven. And then everything begins to happen. 
So I want to I want to ask you a question right now, and I want you to be thinking about this while we study the entire book of Revelation. Who is in charge of the tribulation? Since here we are in the throne room, who is actually in charge? Jesus. That's right. Okay, so let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. We want to make no mistake about that because I think many times people have thought the devil is in charge of the tribulation because they feel like it's so bad. But he is never in charge. <laughs> he thinks he's in charge. He's a liar and a thief. All right. I have a quick question. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Megan. Um, because you said um, when you asked us that question, we kind of said God, but then you said that's right, Jesus. But I'm just curious because Jesus himself uh, says that no one knows the day or the hour, not even the sun. So we'll go, you mean we will go over that. But let's look right here at chapter five and I'll say why I say Jesus. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll. Who's the one who sits on the throne? Jesus. The father, probably the father who's sitting on the throne, right? Okay, with a scroll written on the inside and the back, it's sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll? Now, so we have this scroll and God, sit, the Father, sitting on the throne. And who created the heavens and the earth? God. God owns it all. He owns the whole thing. Now, he's holding this scroll. And I believe this, that this, this scroll represents the title deed to the earth. You have a title to your home. You have a title to your car. You own them, except for the taxes. If you don't pay the taxes, <laughs> the government owns them. <laughs> Basically, I think my, my mom or my dad always used to say the government owns it regardless. <laughs> If I don't have it, uh, I might own the title, but the government, you know, eventually, uh, because they can take it, right? If we don't pay the taxes, but God owns it all. Okay. And, uh, it represents this scroll is the title deed, but it also represents the plan, the battle plan necessary to cleanse the earth and to prepare it for Jesus to rule over this earth. Now, the Garden of Eden, when it was all fresh and this earth was uh, ready and God had, um, uh, it had been completely made brand new it was beautiful and the lord said this is good this is good this is good this is good it was ready for the lord to rule then and he wanted to rule beside man he wanted to rule with man right but adam and we were all inside adam right we were all a part of him at that time we or adam made the choice to choose one of the trees. What were the two trees? Good tree good of knowledge. knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. life. Tree of life. Yeah. So he making that choice, the knowledge of good and evil and, and the sin that Adam and Eve committed brought in the knowledge of good and evil, things that they never dreamed they would know. Imagine the knowledge of good and evil. What a what a what an incredible thing! What an incredible time! So, um, God still has the title deed to the earth, um, but this is what is going to happen. So he, when he takes back. The um, all, now we know at the cross, Jesus paid the price for everything, right? But we are still in operation with evil. There's devil still rules or still um, roars like a lion and going to and fro on the earth, looking whom he may devour. He still, we still have sickness. We still have pain. We still have uh, disease. We have loss. We have 
um, accidents, we have um, crazy weather patterns, we have things that are destructive, we are still operating with a certain amount of the enemy um, control over things. Now, we have authority, and we need to take authority. My boy, I tell you, when the tornadoes get stirred up in Kansas, my mom is standing out there saying, no, you won't come on my property, and she's never had any any anything any property damaged me her or my father and my when we lived in clay center we had tornadoes i'm it's tornado time right now so <laughs> uh my parents stood and said no you will not touch us and the tornado l literally came through our town like a uh like a train and uh ripped up a lot of stuff but our house was not damaged at all a big tree was uprooted in our front yard and just laid it looked like it was just laid down um didn't hit anything didn't hit in we had no loss but other than the tree and um but we know that we're still having to deal with issues of the fall now but soon the lord is going to say that's it and there are certain triggers to that moment when he says that's it and we're going to talk about those all right <clears throat> so through this whole chapter 5 that we're on right now, clear to the end of Revelation, this is the beginning of the plan of God to take care, take down evil, to dethrone the enemy completely, and rule and reign on the earth. Now, um, let's see. So I think what we'll do right now is we're going to define just a couple of terms. We won't read any more right yet, but I want to define some of the terms from Scripture, and they're in your notes here. And let's move for, uh, forward. It says, so we just defined what the title deed of the scroll is, all right? And so whenever, I, when, whenever we talk about the title deed, we're referring back to chapter 5, verse 1, 2, 3, right in there. And in that title deed are seven seals. Now, these seven seals, we know are going to be opened. And let's actually, let's do read just a little bit more um, because it's so good. <laughs> okay. So on the... So, uh, there's a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open this scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. What a sight this had to be in the throne room of heaven. So here's what John says. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it, even to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And I, then I looked and behold. So we will go back to that soon. That's one of my very favorite passages. <laughs> I looked and behold, and there is the lamb. Now, the first time Jesus came, he came as a what? A lamb. The second time he re when he returns, he's going to come back as a what? Lion. The lion of Judah. So he's going to look different, right? And we're going, we want to be ready for that. Okay. What is the day of the Lord? In your notes, what is the day of the Lord? There, the day of the Lord is two extremes related to Jesus' return. And here's what it says in Joel chapter 2, verse 11. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now, we have thought of great and terrible as both horrible, right? <laughs> I want to tell you that the great day of the Lord for the saints, for you and I, for those of us who love the Lord, it is going to be unlike any other time. It will truly be the great day of the Lord. It will be exciting. 
It will be unlike, unprecedented in our lives. We have never seen anything. And if all of the prophets looked forward to this time and looked forward to see what was going to happen and even wanted to live during this time, believe me, it's something to look forward to. All right. Now we've, we've thought about this and thought, oh, this is just all terrible, terrible, terrible. No, it's the great day of the Lord. And that's what the Lord says. That's how the Lord defines it. So we're going to go with that. All right. Now it is also the terrible day, the very terrible day who can endure it. And who is, who is the one that it's going to be terrible for? The unbelievers. The, the ones who hate God. Um, I, um, the way I, I, I teach from with Mike Bickle's uh, understanding of this whole scripture. So International House of Prayer, and I, I meant to tell you this sooner, but I, I um, have studied for about the last 15 years, Mike Bickle and how they study, they fast and pray over every single thing that they uh, bring forth. And one of the things that Mike um, teaches is um, that it's, the, the terrible day for those who shake their fist against God. I don't want you to think that it's just those that are maybe on the fence and they're just like, oh, I'm just not sure. Or maybe they were believers and they kind of gone away from the Lord and, and they're still waffling. It's not that. It's those people who hate God and are shaking their fist at God. And there are those people. I think we have been exposed to that in our country just recently with a lot of the things going on and watching in politics. Uh, some of those who just absolutely hate everything that is going on. And um, that is the, the, I'm not saying this politician or that politician is the terror, is evil and wicked and all that. But I do wanna say that those that shake their fist against God and who hate him and will not ever serve the Lord. Those are the ones that the Lord is going to go to war against. And there's a very good reason for that. Because in order to bring um, the evil systems of this world down, he has to bring down the, uh, the people that control those systems. Now those systems, we'll talk about this more as well. But the systems are the Socratic systems. The things that all run together. We know that our Babylonian system is um has been run for a very long time by very wicked people and they make billions of dollars off of the rest of us right there's systems that we can't we have no control over um and so those systems are the things that do not bow their knee to god they are all about um, thinking that they are going to control the um, world and let me just say the Bilderbergers the Rothschilds, we all know about these, some of these histories that have been go going on, the, um, uh, those systems that have been in place for centuries, those families, there's big families, and I'm not saying all of those families are evil, that's not what I'm saying, but they run systems and they're all intertwined. And it's shocking to hear the intertwining of all of the systems of this world, the financial system, the media systems, the uh, the Hollywood, well, the Hollywood wicked media, and I'm talking about the wicked stuff. Um, the uh, abortion would not be possible, and would not be acceptable if pornography was not in place, and if um, there were righteous people stopping these things with human trafficking. These things would not be happening. And so one of the things that we are praying right now is that um, pornography, abortion, human trafficking, which is like a trifecta of evil, three things that work together. Um, if, if none of these things were in place, we would not be having the issues of abortion that we're having, and of, of um, satanic stuff that we're having. So these things, and that's just one of the wicked things that runs together, and that runs right along with um, idol worship, sat Satan worship. So those things are in place and the Lord is going to war against those because it is destroying innocence. And that's what I want to see the Lord do. I want to see the Lord bring down this evil system. 
How many of you have been in debt your entire life or been in your, in your family has been in debt our entire life? The financial systems of this world um, are most of the time to keep, for the major part of it, are to keep all of us in debt to a system that we can never overcome. Um, we might be successful. We might be able to overcome to a certain extent. But in the end, the you see what's on our dollar bill, right? There's that all-seeing eye. <laughs> There's that Babylonian uh, system right there on our on our money. Our government, same thing. There's been these systems that run together and try and bring in evil. Same thing with uh, education. Same thing with um, boy. We could go to all the seven mountains. The family. They're trying to destroy the family through different things. So those are the things that God, um, all of the things that they all, notice they all fight against the things that God set up. God set up the family. God set up what marriage is and those systems that want to tear down the family and are, they are wicked at their core. They want to destroy people. And so the Lord is going to go to war against those things. And that's what the whole book of Revelation uh, much of this is about is how the Lord is going to go to war against the enemy. All right. The enemy of, from, of us, the enemy. The Lord knows that none of this is good for us uh, until he, just, he can destroy what the enemy is doing to us. All right. So Joel, so it's going to be the great day for us and the terrible day for wicked people. All right. Uh, and before the great day of the Lord, he says, I will send you Elijah before the great, great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's in Malachi 4, 5. And there again it is, great and dreadful day. Just think of great as good because it's going to be good for us, okay? <laughs> the great day of the Lord refers to the unusual events, both positive and negative, that will escalate in the final three years before Jesus' return. It is his day. Jesus will act on earth with great power for us, his people, and against his enemies. He will show himself as the great warrior king who will aggressively confront sin. Um, he, he came the first time as a lamb and the next time he comes as the lion. This will be a time of blessing for the redeemed and judgment for those who refuse him. Jesus' judgments will shake all that can be shaken on earth. What is the tribulation? Uh, tribulation is distress or suffering resulting from oppression or persecution. That's what Webster's Dictionary says. In this study, we will refer to the tribulation as the first three and a half years of the uh, seven-year period. So the first three and a half years is the tribulation. Um, and then the second, then the great trib tri tribulation, uh, the great uh, part of it is the final three and a half years. So the tribulation is the first three and a half. The great tribulation is the final three and a half. And we'll go into that more next week. We'll, we'll actually start there. But here's a scripture that I want you to dwell on and what we are going to focus on this entire study. It's John 16, 33 at the bottom of your page three. It says, everything I've taught you, this is what Jesus said, Everything I've taught you is so that the peace which is in me will be in you and you will and will give you great confidence as you rest in me. For in this unbelieving world, you will experience troubles and sorrows and some Bibles say or tribulation, but you must be courageous for I have conquered the world. So what is the answer that Jesus is giving us? He doesn't say, oh, woe it is for you. Woe, you poor people. <laughs> I'm going to come in and I'm going to take care of, boy, you guys are in for it. No, here's what he said. He said, everything I've been teaching you is about how you can rest in me. And I want to give you great confidence for that day is coming and you will experience some trouble. Yes, but be courageous because I have overcome the world. Um, praise Hallelujah. the Lord. <laughs> so that is our blessed hope 
that is where we want to stay is in that place of peace and we may start quoting that the first part of our class because we really want to dwell in that place of peace um, especially in this day and we want to be the ones who carry the spirit of peace upon us and when we go into a store when we go into a place where they're they are shook up and and i i don't know if any of you've seen any of that there's been some just people just seem to be in an upheaval but the Lord, we can be the people that carry the spirit of shalom, the spirit of peace upon us. All right? Yeah. So, all right, Jenny, where are you? <laughs> she's our wonderful administration, and she's going to divide us up. We've got groups set up. And? Yeah. So, oh, just a second. Um, uh, Okay. All right. So everyone is in your core group and um, you may, uh, so I'll flip the button and then you will go into your core group and you'll need to accept to go into it. So it'll say you're assigned to breakout room one, two or whatever, three or four, and then click yes, I'll join. And then you'll go there. And then right before what Stephanie, maybe about 20 minutes after. Yeah. 20 minutes after. About 20 after then I'll send an email kind of a message that says the breakout rooms will close in one minute and then you'll finish up your conversation and then you'll be back together okay and when we come back then we're going to pray and just close it down and in your core groups I didn't send out anything to the leaders and I apologize for that I my life got a little bit nuts um, we are going to um, what I want you to do tonight is just meet each other um, and just have a bit of conversation maybe tell each other what you do or um, with something that you love um, about the Word of God whatever you would like to talk about just spend a little bit of time together and, and get to know each other and then um, 20 minutes and we'll be back all right my friends I know you're all gonna be friends because you're all amazing people I was like oh my goodness these groups are such power powerhouses <laughs> So this is going to be good. All right. Enjoy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, Steph. Hey. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness, it feels good. Is everything going okay? Is every can you see everything? <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesome. So do you want to go into any of the groups or just kind of hang out? I think I'll hang out and maybe next time I'll make it available that I can pop into a you know each of the groups and maybe talk about I'd like them to get comfortable tonight and then uh, then I can answer questions or whatever next time so okay if you're so your co-host could so could you please click on where it says more or something do you have where a little thing on the bottom that says breakout rooms or where it says more do you have something that says breakout rooms um my more says chat record on this computer or record to the cloud so it does 